Welcome to Uprising. Each episode looks inside what it takes to lead the most dynamic and successful cultural movements. Some of them in the business world, some in the social realm, some in politics, and some in between, to see why people start uprisings, what gives those initiatives momentum and keeps them going, and most important, what lessons can you learn from these movements and how to apply them to your business and even personal life. Let's explore the secret to sparking movements that move people into action. Passionate ideas. Controversial ideas. Uprising ideas. The power is now in the hands of anyone. To start a cultural movement. Your movement. To to move move the the world. There is a new movement in America and beyond the United States, and it seems to be a new way in the world. Everyone has a way of being, and many seem to be moving to a new way of being, and they seem to be very angry. There's rhetoric, xenophobia, fear-mongering. There is an angry movement underway. What is happening out there? Julian Bagini is a world-renowned philosopher and author. In his TED Talk, Bagini claims that there is no real you, in the sense that you are a separate thing. There is a you, in that you are a collection of your experiences and thus change with time and new encounters. Well, thank you, Scott. I'm Julian Pagini, and I'm probably best known for a book called The Pig That Wants to Be Eaten, which is a book of philosophical thought experiments, although more recently I've written Freedom Regained and The Ego Trick. Well, I think it's a complex phenomenon, basically, what's going on. Um, And there are many ways of trying to understand it. But I think the most simplest way to understand it is to begin by taking it somewhat at face value. Uh, People say they're angry. They don't sort of like, (laughs) when you point out they're angry, they don't go, oh, gosh, sorry, I hadn't noticed. I thought I was behaving calmly. Uh, They're angry and they believe they have a right to be angry. And the reason they're angry is that they believe that to use a, a somewhat troublesome word that the political elites and so forth have betrayed them, have left them behind. The ordinary person has been given a pretty bum deal by uh, the global economic system and by government, uh, and people are angry, and perhaps they don't necessarily understand exactly the causes of this, so they will channel their anger into whoever most seems to express it in a powerful and what might be seen to be as an effective way. Do people have a sense of hopefulness in the midst of all this anger and the anger movement? Well, I mean, I think it possibly does. It must do in a way. I mean, anger is an interesting emotion. I think it's not always a negative one. I mean, there are times when it's exactly right to be angry and anger has actually driven a lot of social justice and social change movements. And of course, that's what the sort of populists, which is the way they're generally referred to uh, elsewhere than America. And in America, populism has a particular meaning which isn't the same elsewhere. So just to sort of clarify that, pop, pop, uh, Trump is a populist in uh, European and sort of global terms, meaning he's someone who basically uses rather simplistic rhetoric to sort of rally the people as a lump and mass against the elites. And uh, there is a sense of justice behind a lot of that anger, a sense that something is wrong and people want it to be better. And then therefore, as you say, there's actually a hope aspect to it as well. Yeah. Do you see similarities in the way that you think about the individual being an entity uh, made up of cells and bacteria and other elements uh, and also a movement? Do you see similarities in how those are formed? I think political movements are you know, quintessentially like that because within a political movement, you have people who uh, can wildly disagree about all sorts of things. I mean, you know, it's just true. It's an obvious truism that any political party is in itself a coalition. And in Britain and America, actually, which have traditionally had two party systems, that were very broad coalitions in, in lots of ways. I mean, if you think about Republicans in America, you've got a lot of like, you know, socially and religiously conservative people there. You've also got people who are perhaps more socially liberal, but are not economically, uh, economically liberal. And, and it, 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 so there's economical liberalism and there's political liberalism. So, you know, these groups are broad coalitions. And what happens is that they gain a sense of identity when whatever it is that's bringing it together seems strong enough and in this case you know people are rallying around this sense of injustice and grievance and so it's bringing together a lot of people who you know in so many ways just wouldn't agree at all politically but they agree on this one thing people are being screwed anger is 
almost an imperfection of, of how you behave as a human being. But in this kind of mass movement, is it a form of madness? With this, this anger movement, the problem is not so much that people are angry, it's just that the anger, it's too raw, it's too unreflective, it's not really enough, not enough thought is going into what it truly demands, what will solve the problems that are, are causing it. And so the, the sort of emotional outburst is just being allowed to completely dictate uh, how people are behaving and what people are doing. Then that's, that's a character fault that we may have. How will we get back to being reasonable and rational beings? We have lost sight of the value of reason and rationality. The, the problem is, though, that, that there are just, one can't blame that all entirely on the people who are overtly against it or attacking it. But now today, it seems like that whole concept of rationalism is just disappearing. There seems to be a total lack of what I would describe as a rational culture. So if we, if we look at the kind of irrationality of this anger movement, it has a certain aspect. Part of it is just a kind of laziness, if you like, because actually it's hard work to think things through properly. And often what we do is we settle for what seems rational uh, instead of just really asking, testing that, seeing, seeing if what, what really is rational. The way a lot of people see it is that we've been told certain things by very smart people for a very long time who claim that this is rational, it's all for our own good, it's trickle-down economics, that liberalization is, is for the, in favor of everybody and so forth. And look, it, it, they're talking nonsense, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, we're, we're still left off. So there's a disillusion with the intellectual elites. People go, yeah, right, I'm fed up of, of listening to all these intellectual over fabrications of things that's all nonsense let's tell it like it is i think the mainstream is guilty f is partly responsible for the degradation of this culture of rationality because for too long now in many countries certainly in britain and i think in america as well campaigns have been led on you know what is shown to have worked by marketing people people basically simple slogans simple messages that stick in their head there's been very little faith that um, it's possible to put forward good arguments for, for some time and I think that unfortunately has, uh, has, has opened the door then for people with even simpler messages to come in and be even more compelling. You know if the choice is between a kind of a authentic real kind of person who's just offering simplistic slogans and someone who looks like a, a fake spin doctored you know polit political machine who can't really reach the people, then it's not so surprising, perhaps, that uh, who's coming out on top there. As a philosopher, do you look at like a Bernie Sanders and say, "Wow, this is this is a really positive development"? I, I think what's encouraging about some of the what we might call insurgent political movements is that they do have a serious engagement with ideas and they have a serious sort of like belief that you know one doesn't have to simply accept the status quo straightforwardly as it is that 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 change is possible and for too long we told this is just the way things have to be and they recognize the fact that that's just not true you know political systems are, are, don't just spring in to existence through forces of nature they're always constructed and we always have the option to reconstruct them in a recent article in scientific american they found a rage disorder linked with a parasite found in cats it seems that the parasite hijacks the brain and they think it does it in humans too it is possible that one of the political candidates out there that has exhibited signs of rage is suffering from the effects of toxoplasmosis that might explain so much of what we've seen on the campaign trail is this angry politician really angry? The short answer is, is no. I don't think we've got any reason to think that at all. But also, I don't think that way of thinking is very helpful, actually, because, okay. you know, I because to dismiss people like that is like, well, you know, they're suffering from some kind of pathology. They've been taken over by a virus. I mean, that's, that's not going to help us really understand what's behind it, you know? And no matter how unpleasant we might I think certain leaders of these organizations are. Most of the people who support them are just ordinary, ordinary people. So I, I don't think we should, we should think of it like that. And I, I don't think, you know, in the sense, the question of what forms his identity is, is the most important thing. It's, it's what is it that's leading a lot of people to identify with it. And actually, there's a lot there which is relevant around identity, actually, because, I mean, identities are multiple. This is an important thing, you know. 
you know, uh, so a, a person may be uh, a Christian, uh, a Democrat, an American uh, football fan, uh, you know, all these things. There are lots of things that make up our identities. And in politics, what often happens is that certain forms of identity are prioritized or made central. They're made more salient. And this is a very dangerous thing to do when it leads to division. So mm. I think one real problem is around religious identities, for example. Mm. You know, I think a lot right. of time in countries like Britain in particular, you know, religious identity was just not an issue. It was not an issue. It wasn't a problem either way. You know, you could be a Christian, a Muslim, whatever you were, and it wasn't a problem. At the same time, you know, you wouldn't have to advertise the fact. Now, what's happening is that for various reasons, partly to do with events in the world, religious identities are being made really important. So now you've got you know, policies being proposed which stop people from entering a country on the basis of just one of their identities, that they belong to a particular religion. And that's deeply dangerous because it divides people. Now, and, it, and, it, and it also, I think, by, by, by privileging that particular identity, by making that the, the most defining thing about a person, their religion, that, and that's a very, I think that's very un-American actually, because you know I think the American tradition is that you are an American citizenship is an inclusive thing, which enables beneath that for you to have all your other identities. So, the, the privileging of the religious identity in the dreams of the four, I think, is is a deeply problematic aspect, and it's used to. It happens because that's a way of rallying people together, but that creates in groups and out groups. It creates very dangerous division. How do we stand up to the anger movement? How can we recover a sense of equanimity and peacefulness? Well, that's a big question. But if we just stick to the, that's the political side of that for the moment rather, rather than the personal. You know, I, th I think one of the most important things we've got to remember is that politics is a business of negotiation about competing interests in which not everyone can have what they want, but we have enough of what we want uh, in order so that so we can all live together as, as peacefully as, as possible. And I think what people have to recognize is that much as their anger with the political establishment is very justified, I mean, there are all sorts of things wrong with the political establishment, and people are quite right to want change, that in their anger, they shouldn't just sort of like jump on to uh, you know, equal and opposite forces which have their own pernicious aspects. And I think we have to accept the fact that this is, this is hard work, and that the first thing we've got to do is, to a sense, calm down. But at the same time, you know, we do. There has to be a demand. People have to, and people have to vote, not with their feet, but literally vote with their with their crosses for a candidate that is going to sort of like try and sort of move in that direction. And the first, you know, and and it's, you've always got to go to the, for the least perfect option at any given point. But you know, we've got to keep pushing in that direction. We've got to keep the pressure on the political establishment to be more responsive and more responsible. But, and, but not to succumb to the temptation to back the more simplistic voices who, who sort of claim that actually, you know what, it's straightforward. Let's just bomb them or build the fence <laughs> or whatever it might be. So there you go. So you, I've come out on where I stand on that. <laughs> Marketing culture has embedded the need for catchy, simplistic messages. The Anger Movement. Julian Bagini, philosopher, author. Thank you. For your wonderful inspiring words thank you for joining our uprising today and listening to our show if you missed the show or if you want to find out more about who was on or if you want to learn more about how to create your own uprising please go to uprisingmovements.com you can also download this uprising program from itunes uprising was produced by nicola Keneally and adam helen with special help from melanie boardman Karen Drakenberg, Philippa Freeman, Brianna Campbell, Fashad Faroudi, Mark Bruzzi, Will Issam, James Politi, and Jonathan Weeks. My name is Scott Goodson, and you've been listening to Uprising. What we can learn about movements and uprisings that are shaping our world in business, in society, and in between. For more on cultural movements and movement marketing, be sure to pick up a copy of the best-selling book, Uprising, How to Build a Brand and Change the World by Sparking Cultural Movements, available on Amazon.com. Music for Uprising composed by Charles Duchateau. Composed by Charles Duchateau.